Smithy. First of all, thank you very much for all the kind words. Uh, as I said, um, I mean, it's an absolute privilege and honor to be amidst you doing this session and kick starting this webinar series. Um, it, it is quite daunting to be doing this talk in the midst of so many of my um, esteemed teachers. Um, Parvati Madam um, has been my professor during my undergraduate days and then a mentor during my postgraduate days, um, uh, my, my, my time as lecturer in Trishwood Medical College. Sushma Madam uh, was my examiner for DCH. Um, and Lulu Madam, again, um, was my um, uh, teacher, mentor, and she was always um, encouraging my other pastures as well. Uh, and all the teachers, uh, my teachers in Calicut Medical College, um, um, it's difficult to go through by each name, but it's an absolute honor to be doing this session in your presence. I have a few disclaimers to make. Um, first of all, I am not an immunologist. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist, and we only deal with the overactive immune system. So I have my knowledge on primary immunodeficiency is fairly primitive, and I wouldn't be best placed to answer any questions on that. But we like to deal with the overactive immune system because we know a thing or two about immunosuppression. So that is my um, remiss in this specialty. So when Gita Madam approached me, um, to kind of do this seminar, uh, it so happened that it was one of my areas of interest and I am um, I'm one of the members of the Systemic Autumn Inflammatory Diseases Panel we have in UK. So I was more than happy to do this uh, uh, session. So many thanks to Gita Madam, Calicut Medical College, um, IAP Calicut, uh, and all other organizers for having me do this talk. The second disclaimer I have to make is I'm going to make this very simple because you are going to have experts in their respective fields. Now, if you look at the rest of the speakers, they are clearly experts in their field, unlike me, because I'm just a rheumatologist who does a bit of auto-inflammatory diseases, whereas many of them are doyens in their field. So you are going to obviously hear and learn from them as we go by. So my aim is just to introduce the subjects and briefly describe the conditions and illustrate them through a few cases. With that introduction, I think I'll go to my first slide. So the roadmap for today would be, I'll be introducing you to the concept of auto-inflammatory diseases without going into any great molecular detail. Periodic fevers, what is periodic fever? And a brief overview of systemic auto-inflammatory diseases cause, that cause periodic fever. Diagnostic challenges, so what are the clinical and laboratory clues um, in the diagnosis of a periodic fever or an auto-inflammatory or a monogenic periodic fever rather? What are the, again, very brief principles of management? And then I'll illustrate this through two cases. I know we have started a bit late and, and I'm kind of notorious to overrun my lectures anyway. So when you think it's a time to stop, just ask me, there is no problem. A few disclaimers, as I said, the focus is essentially on a clinical approach. What should a general pediatrician or when, it, when should the penny drop for a general pediatrician or when should, it, when should a general pediatrician be suspecting uh, an auto-inflammatory disease? So I'm not going into the inflammasome and all the molecular details. It's, it's essentially focused on clinical approach. A list of systemic auto-inflammatory diseases are exhausting and almost growing by the day. I will confine my focus to periodic fevers. I will have a very brief overview of individual conditions. So I will not be going into each condition at length because we, we are going to have experts talking about that in great detail. And I'm struggling a little bit to apply this to the Indian context because my experience with autumn plant diseases while working in India is quite limited. But I'll, I've tried to um, get a couple of slides from my Indian colleagues, which might actually throw my light on, more light on this. So the very basic question when we discuss autumn inflammatory diseases and periodic fever is what is the definition of fever? And it's universally accepted that any temperature more than 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 degree Fahrenheit is accepted as fever. We have a lot of patients referred to as with recurrent fever, but if you look at the fever chart, they would have had temperatures of 37.4, 37.5. So it is not a fever, so it's not a recurrent fever at all. So once we talk about fever, we have essentially three main things in our mind. Is this infection, is this inflammation, 
or is this neoplasia? There are other rare causes, but these are the three common things that would come to our mind. So I'm going to focus on the inflammation bit of this differential diagnosis. And when you talk about inflammation causing fevers, you're talking about periodic fever versus persistent fever. And I'm going to confine my discussion to periodic fevers. So as I said, a brief introduction to auto-inflammatory diseases. So when I was doing my microbiology and immunology, um, we were kind of talking in terms of um, cell-mediated immunity and humoral immunity. Now, the two broad classification of the immune system is um, innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Now, innate immunity, as you all know, is a rapid, non-specific immune response, which has got no immunological memory. So it's very primitive, but it can be quite catastrophic. Whereas adaptive immunity is much more sophisticated, clever immune response, which develops more slowly, which is more specific in and has got immunological memory. So we need to have this concept to understand the difference between auto-inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. So auto-inflammatory diseases, which are the remit of discussion today, are essentially a problem with the innate immunity. And the major players here are macrophages and monocytes. Unlike autoimmune diseases like JIA or lupus, which is a problem with an adaptive immunity and the main players are the lymphocytes. Again, similarly, the cytokines which are involved are also different because you often get an inflammatory storm in auto-inflammatory diseases and the main players there are the interleukins, which is important from a treatment point of view because you would want to target them to get the better response. Whereas autoimmune diseases are essentially um, kind of a TNF driven and other markers rather than interleukins, especially interleukin one. So the examples are all the inherited monogenic, monogenic periodic fevers we are going to discuss today, like CAPS, FMF, TRAPS, HITS, etc. cetera. Um, certain um, multifactorial uh, conditions like PFAPA syndrome, acquired conditions, most commonly Cystil's disease, and some rare conditions which are now deemed as auto-inflammatory like gout and Schnitzler syndrome, which are not applicable to the pediatric population. Most of the classical autoimmune conditions like GIA, Crohn's disease, psoriasis, lupus, um, Wegner's, which is now called granulomatosis, polyangiitis, are all uh, examples of classical autoimmune diseases, but not auto-inflammatory. So summarizing, auto-inflammatory diseases are classified, uh, include conditions which are monogenic, which means a single mutation explains the pathogenesis, or multifactorial, as in PFAPA syndrome, which could be infection slash genetic slash environmental, inflammatory conditions, which are characterized by an exaggerated activation of innate immunity in response to exogenous or endogenous stimuli in the absence of high teeter autoantibodies. So basically this definition not only describes autoinflammatory conditions, but also excludes autoimmune conditions. But this is an interesting slide, which I have borrowed from uh, one of my colleagues. So although we kind of tend to categorize them separately as autoinflammatory and autoimmune diseases, it is not a clear cut classification. It is a spectrum. For example, if you look at conditions like FMF and CAPS and TRAPS, they are predominantly auto-inflammatory. And as you go further down, for example, if you go to Stills disease, it has got both auto-inflammatory, predominantly auto-inflammatory and some autoimmune elements. And as you further go down, it's predominantly autoimmune and very little auto-inflammatory. So you can get a patient with lupus who has got a bit of macrophage and activation syndrome, which is not cytokine storm. It's an auto-inflammatory process, but it is predominantly autoimmune, but a small element of auto-inflammatory. So what I was trying to say is it's not as black and white and compartmentalized as I said earlier. It is a mixture. So the periodic fevers, the monogenic periodic fevers are more auto-inflammatory when compared to conditions like lupus and GIA, which are more autoimmune. So when should one suspect auto-inflammatory disorders? What are the symptoms? If they are inherited, most often the onset is early, 
Early means the first few years of life. It could even be in the first year of life. One of the most important defining symptoms is fever. Again, the fever could be periodic or persistent. And for academic discussion for monogenic inherited disorders, I shall confine the discussion to periodic fevers today. What is the predominant laboratory um, uh, manifestation or the laboratory characteristics of inflammatory disorders? They have spectacularly raised inflammatory markers, CRP, ESR, ferritin. And serum amyloid A is one thing which is very important because it is actually a persistent elevation of serum amyloid A, which can define organ damage going forward. And it is not just a mild elevation. So if you are in a, for example, if it's a systemic onset GIA or somebody who has got CAPS, they often have CRPs in hundreds, ESR in 50 to 100, and ferritin often in thousands. So the, all these inflammatory markers are quite significantly elevated than you would expect in an autoimmune or infective situation. They may have symptoms pertaining to various other systems, depending on the diagnosis. Skin rashes are very common. In fact, they, they help us diagnose or nail down the diagnosis. Um, GI symptoms, um, abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, musculoskeletal manifestations. They can have joint pain, myalgia, fasciitis, etc. Chest symptoms, mainly because of pleuritic chest pain, especially in conditions like FMF. So basically, they have cirrhositis. Um, eye manifestations, which is, I'll come to which condition you get these, and sometimes hematological manifestations, and even, even uh, what we call uh, a macrophage activation syndrome as a complication. But the most important point is whenever you suspect auto inflammatory disorders, we do not embark on any kind of treatment unless we have made sure that we have ruled out infection and malignancy which are the most important differential diagnosis. Because the medications we are going to throw at them would be steroids or other immunosuppressants, which can be catastrophic if you have missed leukemia, for example. So this is a brief overview of, uh, uh, um, I think if you look at auto-inflammatory disorders, um, and um, I just listened to Dan Kastner about two months back, and there are new auto-inflammatory disorders being discovered almost on a daily basis. So this is a list as it stood probably about three or four years back. So the most important categories, as I said, periodic fever, the monogenic periodic fevers, then there are conditions called cryopyranopathy or CAPS, cryopyran associated periodic syndrome. Then there, is a, there are some granulomatous disorders like Blau syndrome. So basically, Blau syndrome is an auto-inflammatory inherited equivalent of sarcoidosis in children. Sarcoid in the classical form is very rare in children, but Blau syndrome is a sarcoid-like inherited illness in syndrome. There are certain pyogenic disorders. Um, there are certain um, uh, auto-inflammatory disorders that affect brain, uh, sorry, bone, like CRMO, which is chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. And there are certain miscellaneous conditions like DIRA, which is a problem with interleukin-1 receptors. And there is another broad category called interferonopathies, about which Professor Yannick Crow, who is a good friend of mine, is going to talk in a few weeks' time. But this is a broad classification, but I'm going to confine my discussion to the auto-inflammatory disorders which cause periodic fevers. So the first question then is, what is periodic fever? When is recurrent fever a periodic fever? Obviously, we don't call it periodic fever unless it's recurrent, so it has to be recurrent. But the most important thing is it most often is predictable. So if you speak to a child with FMF or PFAP even, the parents are often able to say that he's going to have an attack next week. So the timing is so predictable and that sets it apart from any other recurrent fevers. For example, recurrent fevers because of recurrent tonsillitis or whatever. So one important aspect is the predictability. So the second thing is stereotype because they have the same symptoms with fever every time. So in January, you get fever with runny nose. In February, you get fever with sore throat. In, in April, you get fever with uh, diarrhea and vomiting. That is not stereotypy. So they're probably all different viral infections. Whereas in, in, a, in what, to, before we call it periodic fever, we need to make sure that there is a stereotypic um, element to these episodes, both in terms of symptoms and in terms of the rough duration. The other classical feature is the children are completely well in between. Although there are exceptions, which I'll come to later, but usually the children are completely well between the episodes. 
Now, symptoms last a few days and they go away. Why should we even bother to investigate or refer these patients? First of all, morbidity, because in many of these conditions, the children are so unwell, um, unwell during an episode, they often miss school. So for a child who is missing about 12 to 20 days of school every year, it's a significant effect on education and everything. You can have long-term life limit, limit, limiting complications, most notoriously amyloidosis. So many of the patients can go on to have renal amyloidosis and renal failure in their third or fourth decade in time. And then inherited monogenic periodic fevers have other implications because you need to do, think about genetic counseling and other things because this could be transmitted to the next generation. So I need to, um, I mean, I'm uh, indebted to my colleagues for this slide because it's not my slide, I've just borrowed it. So as in a, as a, if you look at periodic fevers or recurrent fevers um, as a broad outline, this would be the differential diagnosis. So we need to think about multifactorial inflammatory diseases, infectious diseases, as we have mentioned. It could be a recurrent infection in a child who has got an underlying primary immunodeficiency. So if you've got recurrent infections, too many infections in the first few years of life, we would naturally think about a primary immunodeficiency, which is very important. And I'm so pleased it's kind of, um, uh, it's uh, investigations and are available now uh, more freely in India. Then you need to think about neoplasia because neoplasms can cause recurrent or persistent fever as well. And then the category of inherited autoinflammatory diseases. So I would like to start my individual conditions with a fairly common multifactorial. So this is not monogenic. It's not monogenic inherited condition. It's a multifactorial inflammatory disease called PFAPA syndrome. So PFAPA syndrome, as the name implies, is a combination of periodic fever with aphthous stomatitis, pharyngitis, and cervical adenitis. This is by far the commonest cause of periodic fever in children. It was first described by Dr. Marshall in 1987, and some people call it Marshall syndrome. Now, there is no clear explanation for the etiology. It is clearly not a monogenic inherited condition. However, there are lots of studies which, which have picked up mutations in certain other periodic fever genes like NLRP3 or the FMF gene in these patients. And there, is, there are some studies which kind of postulate an infective trigger. So the, the cause is not really known, but is thought to be a mixture of genetic, environmental, and infective triggers. Th these children usually present before five years of age with episodes of fever. Each episode usually lasts anywhere between three to six days, usually less than a week. And they recur anywhere between one to two months or four to eight weeks. But as the definition um, implies, the fever is usually associated with at least one of the three main symptoms. So that would be aphthous ulcers, cervical lymphadenopathy, or pharyngitis. On the longer term, prognosis is generally good because this tends to resolve by adolescence but there is no clear indicator as to whether it resolves at 11 years, whether it's not 15 years, 17 years, we don't know, because I've got patients who've had it um, in, well into their 13, 14 years of age, but there is a good chance that this is self-resolved and there is no significant risk of long-term complication by like renal failure. So the diagnostic criteria for PFAPA are fairly loose in the sense um, you can, fit in these criteria for a number of other conditions. So the one thing is, as I said, regularly recurring fever with early age of onset. So that regularity also translates to uh, predictability and stereotypy of episodes. These patients usually have constitutional symptoms in the absence of upper respiratory infection. So if they're having a cold or runny nose, that is not PFAPA syndrome. Then obviously you have at least one of the three things which we mentioned and they're completely asymptomatic back to normal between episodes. And usually this does not affect their growth or development. However, as you can easily say, the specificity is poor because anybody who has got recurrent aphthous ulcers could satisfy this criteria. Anybody who has got recurrent streptococcal sore throat could satisfy this criteria. So the criteria are fairly loose and with poor specificity. However, a new set of um, criteria has been uh, proposed by a group in um, uh, Europe, 
which has been um, validated. So it is the new classification criteria is on the left in this chart. I'm not going to go through this detail. So if you want the reference, the reference is usually at the, usually at the bottom of my slide. Any 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 uh, article I've quoted should be at the bottom of the slide. But this is still being uh, validated. And, and actually, um, we are a part of um, uh, an um, international consortium who are looking into validating this and doing a study on this. What is the treatment? So there are two ways of treating this. One is treat an episode, or two is try and stop an episode, prophylaxis. So treatment, it's actually very simple. We use prednisolone, often a single dose of one to two milligram per kilogram at the onset. And sometimes parents can even predict when the children become unwell, not even before they can actually get fever. And they usually have a rapid resolution of all symptoms. However, after ulcers are probably this is, is probably the symptom which is least responsive to steroids but all of the symptoms including fever usually resolve if there is no response in 12 hours you can actually give a second dose so sometimes what i advise is um, one milligram per kilogram um, at the start and if there is no response give uh, another one milligram per kilogram 12 hours later the slight problem in giving steroids is that in, in some patients, um, in fact, in quite a few patients, it can actually increase the frequency. So those, we, we had one patient who used to get episodes every four to five weeks. And once we started steroids, the parents were really happy that the symptoms went away. But then he started having these symptoms every kind of three to four weeks or even three weeks, which means that he was requiring steroids more often. There is some study, there are some studies saying that you can use an anti-IL-1 agent like Anakindra during episodes. So basically you give an injection of Anakindra at the start of the episode and that may about this. Now, what are the medications which have been tried to reduce the frequency of flies or in a prophylaxis? Um, the one we like to use or we like to try is colchicine and it's used at a dose of 0.5 to 1 milligram, not per kilogram, 0.15 to 1 milligram once daily. Now, um, it, uh, in America, they often use cimetidine at this dose, but the generally overall efficacy is, is considered to be much poorer than colchicine. Now, if you have come to the end of the tether, to the extent that these symptoms are not going away with anything, and the child has got significant morbidity and is affecting normal life, many of this, these patients, we could consider an adenotonsillectomy in these patients. In most of the studies, it definitely benefits patients. But if you look at, depending on your studies, you look from the 90s or until 2000s, the efficacy varies from anywhere from 60 to 100%. Because I have had three or four patients, all of whom have had a complete resolution of symptoms. But we usually tend to reserve it for when the medical treatment fails or is not tolerated. Now we go to the inherited auto-inflammatory diseases causing periodic fevers. So they're essentially, they are fourfold FMF, familial Mediterranean fever, mevalonic kinase deficiency or hyper IgD syndrome, TNF receptor associated periodic syndrome or TRAPS and CAPS, which I said is cryopyrin associated periodic syndrome. So when do we suspect any of these conditions? When the onset is early, almost all of them have significant abdominal symptoms, it may be associated with diarrhea and vomiting. They may have chest pain because of serositis, and there is often a family history. So when I get um, uh, somebody with a periodic fever, the, the two important things I look for is the, for the first thing is the duration. How long is the episode? So the simple rule of the thumb is, if it's a familial Mediterranean fever, it's usually less than 72 hours. Whereas traps, it's usually more than seven days. Sometimes if it goes on to seven, 10 days, 14 days, it's more likely to be traps. Whereas the hyper IgD syndrome, it's in between about three to seven days. So the most important question, one of the things I like to know in a patient with periodic fever is how long does the episode last? So we've only yesterday seen a girl with a classical 48 hour history, who's got chest pain, who's got abdominal pain, who we think has, and the family have come from, um, Kurdistan, I think, um, Iraq, Kurdish Iraq. And um, there is a good likelihood that she has got FMF. So that's the duration is very important. The earliest symptom to ask, the easiest symptom to ask is abdominal symptoms. So these are the three conditions where you have predominant abdominal symptoms, hits, traps, and FMF. 
So if you go further into the symptoms, you can see that they all have a peritonitic abdominal pain and some of them have vomiting and diarrhea. Interestingly, its constipation is more common in FMF, whereas in HITS, it is more um, uh, di vomiting in these patients. Um, with regard to skin rash, you can get an erysipelad skin rash in FMF. Most of these patients do have non-specific joint symptoms. But however, in traps, you can get significant myalgia, focal myositis, fasciitis, etc. They usually don't have organomegaly except for HITS. So when you get a periodic fever patient with a splenomegaly, always think about HITS. Eye manifestations are more common in traps. And many of these patients can also have a, a, some vasculitic effects, especially um, when you get a patient who's got recurrent HSP, that could be a manifestation, especially with fever, that could be a manifestation of some of the periodic fever syndromes, especially FMF. So we've got a girl who has presented initially as HSP, kept having HSP episodes with fever, and she responded really well to colchicine. Now, with regards to genetic, um, uh, FMF is autosomal recessive in the MEFV gene. Um, uh, TRAPS is actually an autosomal dominant um, mutation in, in what we call TNF-S5-F1A. And uh, MVK gene is the one which is affected in the, by an autosomal recessive mutation in patients with HIDS. The second set of conditions I said is CAPS, cryopyrin-associated periodic syndrome. Again, FCAS or familial cold autumn inflammatory syndrome is probably the mildest variety. Most of these people, they, sometimes they get diagnosed in adulthood even, just some cold induced urticaria, nothing at all, no significant elevation of neurological markers, um, neurological markers um, in, um, uh, uh, sorry, inflammatory markers, and they don't have a long-term complication. Now, the most severe auto-inflammatory syndrome is what we call nomid or SINCA. So that's neonatal onset, multi-system inflammatory disease. The onset is usually in early infancy, so which means um, two to three months. Sometimes in the neonatal period, they can present as meningitis, which doesn't respond to treatment, um, sterile arthritis, um, osteomyelitis, etc. They usually present with musculoskeletal and um, uh, neurological manifestations. They can also have an urticarial rash, but this is a condition which needs to be treated very early on because it can very quickly lead to um, brain damage, sensory neural hearing loss, um, eye, eye problems, um, visual uh, cortical visual blindness, and um, arthritis and contractures. So it is incredibly rare, but one, if you get a neonate who has got sepsis slash meningitis slash osteomyelitis, who have not grown any organisms, but is unresponsive to antibiotics, think about nomad. So how to differentiate between the different conditions? So the clinical features, as I said, are often shared. I would like to ask three key questions. One is the age of onset. When did the whole thing start? Often it can be very blurred answer in the sense they said, I think he's probably started after one year, but we only noted that this is coming again and again when he was two or three. So you may not get an answer, but that, that vague answer is still good enough and to give you um, a clear idea of which condition this could be. The most important question for me is the duration of the attack. Is it, again, from an, if, it, if they've got abdominal symptoms, I would always ask, is it less than three days, three to seven days, or more than seven days? Then the frequency. So again, depends on which condition you're dealing with. Which system is affected? That's another important thing. If, as I said, if, there, if they've got abdominal symptoms, I would really be worried about FMF, FMF traps and hits. They can have neurological, in which case, think about, um, you can have that in traps, you can have that in caps, and urticaria. So urticarial rashes are quite characteristic of caps, especially if they have cold-induced urticaria. Uh, a slide, just one slide of, about FMF. We are going to have a whole lecture on FMF, but I'll just very quickly um, take you through FMF. Um, sorry, let me plug in my laptop. So as I said, it's an autosomal recessive condition with a mutation of MEFV gene. And there are hundreds of mutations identified. And sometimes we get a response saying that you've got this mutation. We don't know whether it's clinically significant or not, which is why it's very important to collaborate with the geneticist with the clinical picture so that you can arrive at the right conclusion whether the mutation is significant or not. Um, another is a very simple way of diagnosing FMF is um, if you're suspicious, give colchicine. If, it's, if it is FMF, 99% of the time they will respond. 
So this is usually seen in classic ethnic groups. I'm yet to see a white Caucasian British girl or boy who has got FMF. Most of the patients who have got, they've definitely got some Middle East or even um, uh, North Mediterranean, Italian or Spanish connection. Um, the classical feature is the duration. As I said, the duration is usually only one to three days, usually less than 72 hours. The frequency can vary anywhere from two weeks to six weeks. The classical features are abdominal pain, chest pain, and joint pain. Sometimes they can get neurocyphalous like erythema. So like you can see in this child, this is a classical erythema-like like erythema, you get an FMF. But the biggest problem is why do you need to treat them? Because this is associated with systemic amyloidosis, which can lead to renal failure. So even in adults who have, who have presented with renal failure in their 30s and 40s and there is his amyloidosis, they all get referred to our, what we, we have got something called a national amyloidosis center. And they have picked up so many FMFs retrospectively because they were not picked up. The treatment of choice is colchicine, which works in 99% of patients. So if you've got somebody with suspected FMF and colchicine is not working, it's unlikely that you're dealing with FMF. However, there is a small percentage of colchicine resistant FMF, in which case anti-IL-1 is the best treatment. So the dose of colchicine is quite high in patients with FMF. It's incredible how much colchicine these patients can tolerate. So we have got uh, siblings um, from uh, Lebanon, I think, who have FMF. And the girl is um, about 12 years. She's on 1.5 milligrams, which is actually, if you, if you calculate per milligram, milligram per kilogram, it's actually a big dose. And the boy who's only four is tolerating one milligram without any problems. So most often these patients need a higher dose. I feel that Asian patients tolerate colchicine much, much better than uh, Caucasian patients, where they often get diarrhea and uh, don't, sometimes we advise them to uh, avoid um, lactose-containing diets and slowly reintroduce back. TRAPS or PNF receptor-associated periodic syndrome, which used to be called Hibernian fever, it's very common in Irish population. It is again um, autosomal dominant mutation of uh, TNFR1 gene. This is the one which has got the longest duration for the episodes. The patients are, have fever, abdominal pain, and other symptoms weeks and the interval naturally would be longer because the episodes last longer it'll be probably three or four episodes every year the migratory myalgia is usually identified as one important feature in in these patients um, as i said they all have significant peritonitic abdominal pain and i think there is a family who live in nottingham who a caucasian family who have got traps and whenever that boy flares he's got classical peritonitic features this is again one condition where you can significant eye symptoms. You can get either conjunctivitis or periorbital edema. Sometimes you can get pleuritic chest pain. You can get arthralgia. Um, the raised inflammatory markers are usually elevated. But the important thing here is in even between episodes, you may find that inflammatory markers are elevated in some of these patients. The treatment of choice is you may feel that because this is a TNF receptor problem, anti-TNF would be the best agent. Unfortunately, it's not. So we could try things like etanercept or uh, in these patients, which does work for a few years, but then slowly it stops working. And eventually you have to go to anti-IL-1, which is anakindra, which is given as a daily injection. I'll come to the medications very briefly a bit later. Again, the problem with traps, if you don't pick up and treat in the right time, is they have a higher risk of systemic amyloidosis. So if, when we see a traps patient, an FMF patient for annual review, we always check their serum amyloid levels and also do a urine dipstick for proteinuria. So this is the kind of migratory myalgia, and sometimes you can get the congenital content. You can get a... Um, this, this is actually a, a, a skin rash overlying an area of myositis. And you can, I don't know if it's very clear, you can get a similar picture here as well. So sometimes you can get rashes overlying the area of muscle pain. And this is a fasciitis in a patient with traps. You can see the fascia being inflamed. It looks really bright because of inflammation. Last but not the least, hyper-IGD syndrome, uh, which is otherwise called mevalonate kinase deficiency. This is in between traps and FF, FMF in terms of duration. It lasts about um, uh, three to seven days. Again, predominant symptom is abdominal pain. They often have cervical lymphadenopathy. 
arthritis, arthralgia. So these patients, again, if you take the abdominal pain aside, they can be often be branded as PFAPA because the symptoms often overlap. But one important point is the onset can be before one year of age. There are not many conditions where you start having symptoms in the first year of life. So this is one of the conditions. They can get skin rash. Um, and as one important feature is splenomegaly. So one of the few periodic fevers where you can, probably the highest incidence of splenomegaly is hyper IgD syndrome. Now medications, you, you can try steroids during episodes. Um, in Turkey and other places, they try thalidomide. You can try anti-TNF, but the best treatment is anti-IL-1 treatment again, which sadly is not available in India at this point in time. But the difference between TRAPS and FMF, uh, the use of anti-IL-1 in HIDS is that the response may not be as good as other conditions. So we have a patient who has not actually done well on this. Uh, I'm not going to this criteria. Again, um, the article I'm quoting is at the bottom. So there is a new um, Eurofever diagnostic classification criteria for all these periodic fever syndromes. The beauty of this criteria is that they've got the symptoms which predominate are predominantly seen in these conditions, or they, they can also see, they, can, they are also quoting features which should make you rule out this condition. So absence is very important in these conditions. So with your kind permission, uh, I'm, if I may go to all the cases, and I, as I said, um, Gita, Madam, please feel free to stop me because um, I may go on and on. Is, are we all right time-wise? Yeah, fine, okay. fine. Continue, yeah. continue. Yeah, so we've got, uh, the first one is a six-year-old girl of mixed race. Um, I, I was never conscious about the race, um, how important race is in our patients. And one of the things that made me sit up and um, take note of is auto-inflammatory syndrome because the ethnicity and the race does matter in many of these patients. So this girl basically has had recurrent fever since nine months of age. The classical description is high grade fever, 39 to 40 degrees lasting three days uh, with abdominal pain, but no diarrhea or vomiting. She's also reported sore throat during some episodes and occasionally mouth ulcers, but the carer felt that the mouth ulcers probably were not related to the fever. They just were random episodes. Her past history, she had hemiplegic cerebral palsy of the right side with febrile convulsions, but there was no significant family history. Like most of the periodic fevers, the frustrating bit is they are usually completely normal when you see in the clinic during an interval between episodes. So apart from the spastic paraparesis, she would have been a very good a long case for DCH or MD examination with her paraparesis. But um, apart from that, there was nothing much to see. And uh, the investigations were completely normal. So what I to told them is, I'm not going to do any blood test today. Could you please come back to us when she has the next episode? So one important aspect of assessing patients with periodic fever is to see them during an episode rather than between episodes, because you may not find any useful information either on clinical examination or laboratory investigation if you see them between episodes. So I didn't do any investigation, just asked her to come back. So when we, when she, we actually saw her, she was on the second day of her symptoms. She had abdominal pain the previous morning and a temperature of 39.6 the previous evening. Uh, apart from mild sore throat, there was nothing else. There was no mouth ulcers. When I examined her, she had actually congested throat with large tonsils, but there were no follicles or exudates. She had bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. Abdomen was soft and non-tender. So at that point, my differential diagnosis were, am I dealing with an FMF? Because three days, abdominal pain, possible. The other differential diagnosis is the PFAPA because she's got so um, pharyngitis and cervical adenitis with periodic fever, which started before five years of age. And last but not the least, because the size of the tonsils, I wondered, is this a recurrent streptococcal infection, which is very plausible because um, you have patients who, and she's had multiple courses of antibiotics. And the, the carer couldn't tell me very clearly whether she actually got better before the, before the because of the antibiotics or got better spontaneously. So the investigation showed a C elevated CRP of 33, but most of other investigations were normal. Um, her serum amyloid was 100, but again, serum amyloid during an episode doesn't tell you because amyloid is an inflammatory marker as well. So it is important to check serum amyloid between episodes to look at the risk of amyloidosis. We also did a urine for mavironic acid, which was negative, and her ASO titer was less than 200. 
and we had sent an auto-inflammatory genetic screen specifically for FMF and HITS because those are the two things you would have fitted in and they both came back as negative. So I felt that because FMF is still higher in high in the probability, the easiest way to understand is put them on colchicine because if it's FMF, they will respond to colchicine most often than not. So when we saw her again in three months, she was still getting six weekly episodes, but the grandmother was very clear that the episodes are much milder now. It's probably lasting only 24 hours, maximum 36 hours. So we thought we'll increase the cortisone dose to 750 micrograms. And in the next six months, she had 12 weeks with no episode at all, which is a good thing. But then just before she came in, she had an episode lasting three days. But grandmother said the difference is now she's got significant mouth ulcers. So we thought we'll still give her the benefit of doubt and put her on cold cyst. Now, mouth ulcers make FMF slightly less likely. We are probably leaning towards PFAPA. But we thought we'll give her the benefit of doubt and maximize the dose of cold cyst, which was increased to one milligram. But then when we saw her later, three months later, it was very clear that she was still getting episodes, although less frequent and still lasting three days. But, but now mouth ulcers had become a significant symptom with each episode, along with abdominal pain and sore throat. So then the differential diagnosis changed to be thought this is more probably PFAPA now at this point in time, because she should have responded to the dose of colchicine we have given if she had FMF. So we stopped colchicine and started, the advice was to give prednisolone one milligram per kilogram at the fever of attacks, at the, at the start of the attacks. And she had an excellent response. So I saw her probably in October last year before, um, uh, so she should be due an appointment soon. And she had only had one episode in the whole of tw preceding 12 months and that too lasting only uh, about 12 day, uh, twelve hours. That was what it is. So this retrospectively is PFAPA. I think if you are, if you are bent and making the diagnosis in the first, uh, uh, first, um, uh, first time you see the patient, you are a bit, bit wishful. It is, this is an area where trial and error and repeated reviews definitely makes you wiser. The second gay girl is an Indian girl. I think this is the, she's the only Malayali patient I've had during my um, 15 years of practice in UK. Um, she was having recurrent fever since three years of age. Again, the story was she was having an episode every three to four weeks, lasting about 48 hours. But the only symptom she was having was pain in her lower limbs, mainly thighs. So this is more like myalgia, not even arthralgia. There was no history of joint swelling. Um, she had, however, they did say that during some of the episodes, she used to have sore throat and swollen glands. She did not have any other symptoms. And as always, she was completely well between episodes with no family history. When I saw her in the clinic, the examination was completely fine. However, she was seen by my colleague during an episode and she had some race, uh, elevation in her inflammatory markers. ESR was 21 and CRP was 33. So again, the question is, is this periodic fever? Again, is, if it's periodic fever, is this FMF? Highly unlikely. The duration fits in, but there is no abdominal or chest symptoms. It's just muscle, musculoskeletal symptoms, unlikely. Again, PFAPA, because they said of sore throat and glands, possibly there. But again, you don't expect musculoskeletal pain as a predominant symptom. And again, my question is, this a recurrent streptococcal infection? You can get fever and um, um, musculoskeletal pain as a part of recurrent streptococcal infection. So investigation showed negative genetics for FMF, but our ASO titer came back very high, more than 1600. So it was unmeasurably high. So I didn't do anything. I just gave her a treatment dose of penicillin for 10 days, followed by put her on prophylaxis. She had a normal echo with, with, with my fever, um, musculoskeletal pain, and... Um, uh, high ASO titer, I was very brave. Um, I would have been very brave not to do an echo. The echo was completely normal. So when I just put her on penicillin prophylaxis for one year and she had absolutely no episodes at all during this period. At the end of one year, I'd made sure that, and there was, I did another echo to make sure it was normal and we stopped penicillin. She has never had a problem. So this is an example of a recurrent infection or a, probably a persistent streptococcal carriage masquerading as a periodic fever. So as I said, before we embark on any treatment in any of the conditions, it's important that we rule out infection and if appropriate neoplasia. This is another um, interesting girl who I see in a clinic, which I do about 60 miles from her. This is again a very diff, very uh, strange story. This is a, a white British girl who had recurrent fever since three years of age. Um, uh, mom was saying she had some fevers during uh, from nine months, but she was not very clear, but definitely a, a stereotypic 
predictable fever patterns in three months of age. One episode every month lasting 48 hours. But again, the only symptom she had was headache and fever. And sometimes photophobia said she didn't like bright lights during the episodes. She did not have musculoskeletal pain, abdominal pain, rashes, mouth ulcers, nothing at all. But she was clearly very tired and drained during the episodes that um, she, she was not going to school during the episodes. There is absolutely no family history and she was completely well between. Again, she had normal examination, but my one of my colleagues uh, had seen the child during an acute episode and she had a raised inflammatory marker of her CRP of 30 or 35 during this episode. Again, her auto-inflammatory genetics came back as negative. And I thought one of the, there is, this doesn't sound like PFAPA, but there's absolutely no harm because of the frequency to try her on a bit of colchicin. We just put her on the lowest dose of 500 micrograms and she had an excellent response. I don't know what this condition is. I would probably class it, call it unclassified periodic fever syndrome. She doesn't have FMF, but she had a response to colchicin. So what the family themselves discontinued the medicine after about 18 months. And you know what? She started having a recurrence of these episodes. And then she went back to colchicin. And, uh, and the episodes never happened again. Now, this... The important thing to remember is that she, her genetics was done using a Sanger sequencing. We didn't do a next generation sequencing, which is what we do, which look for entire set of panels. Maybe she's uh, positive for something, I don't know, but she clearly doesn't fit in the textbook description of FMF. Again, the point is we need to try and err in periodic fevers to get it right eventually. Now, this girl is a very interesting girl. So we saw her at eight years of age. She is a Slovakian Roma girl. So now, when you say Roma origin, the, the Roma uh, Europeans have definitely got some South Asian lineage. They have brown skin and black hair, and it should have been something to do with the Silk Route migration or something. So with they, most of them have mutations. Um, they, they, we have found mutations in that family, which can be seen in some Asian populations. I don't know what the link is, but there is clearly they look very Asian. So the story here is she has had problems from about nine months of age, at least some one year of age. But here the episodes were clearly longer when compared to other patients. So she had episodes lasting one week, once every four weeks. So she would have seven out of 28 days in a month would be miserable for her. So she would have fever, sore throat, abdominal pain, joint pain and stiffness and sometimes mouth ulcers. She never had any rashes. And she had received multiple courses of antibiotics, but mother was very clear, even when we gave antibiotics, she should still have fever for five days. So that kind of told me that it was not the antibiotic doing the trick. It was more the episode kind of spontaneously resolving. If this, this there was an option for Q&A, I would have kind of asked you guys what is the most likely diagnosis with that duration. So with that picture, the only different thing for her that she had Bell's palsy history of recurrent Bell's palsy in the past. And she also had one episode of HSP when the family were in Slovakia. And she's also been diagnosed with a sensory neural hearing loss on one side. The school were concerned because she was losing, missing a lot of school, and there was, but there was no significant family history. So on examination, she had a Bell's palsy, obvious still re residual Bell's palsy. She had big tonsils, but again, no follicles, no ulcers, not mouth ulcers. She had cervical lymphadenopathy, joints were normal, no hepatosplenomegaly. But her inflammatory markers were quite high. So we saw her between an episode and she still had an ESR of 40 and CRP of 80. But when we looked at uh, uh, ASO teeter, it was more than 1600. So 1600 was very high. Um, and the throat, the throat swab was negative for streptococcus. So with that streptococcus, very significant, uh, Tita's very significant. I thought the first thing we should do is treat her with penicillin and give her a proton prophylaxis. We did that for eight weeks. She had absolutely no response. She still had an episode lasting a week, both those months. By the time the autoinflammatory genetic screen had come back, showing that she's heterozygous for uh, MKD mutation, which is HITS. Now, the problem is this, she, this is a heterozygous. This is an autosomal recessive condition. She was a heterozygous for that mutation. But the clinical picture fitted in perfectly. She had abdominal pain. She had sore throat. She had um, lymphadenopathy. And, but the, no splenomegaly. But the, the, it usually lasted about seven days, which was the perfect build for MKD. So the clinical picture correlated. So these um, 
genetic results are read by Professor Helen Ackman, who is actually doing the talk next week, who, is, um, who we work together with these patients. So when we described the clinical picture, Helen said, although this is heterozygous, it's not one of the classical mutations, I think let us have the benefit of doubt and put this patient on anakindra, so which is anti-IL-1. However, she had a partial response. She had no episodes at all for three months, but then she started having small episodes due with every period. So we don't, and that's when she had menarche. So we don't know what this, we didn't know what this collection was, but then there are two questions here. Is that because this is not HITS? Or second question is, is that because this is a HITS which is not responsive to anakindra? So because she continued to have the sore throat and lymphadenopathy, she also kind of fitted with PFAPA syndrome. So we thought we would probably send her for a tonsillectomy to see what it does. And you know what? She had an excellent response. Once she had the tonsillectomy, all the episodes stopped and we stopped anakindra. So this is a case where you have a periodic fever who fits in a description of one condition perfectly, which is kind of semi-proven on the genetic test but you give the treat, right treatment, but the patient doesn't respond. So you just need to think outside the box. This patient also would, could have fit in the criteria for PFAPA because the episode lasted about seven days. It's about three to six days in PFAPA. She had sore throat and she definitely satisfied the Marshall's criteria. And which is why we put give her um, a, a suggestion for tonsillectomy and it really worked for her. Am I okay to keep going? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, so this is a three-year-old boy again, very interesting. A white um, British um, uh, young man who has been having fever since 18 months of age and regular episodes since two years of age. So basically, the story is he definitely becomes clingy and tired, um, lethargic, off food. Then he develops abdominal pain and joint pain, and the next day he develops fever up to 39 to 40 degrees. So everything happens within 12 to 24 hours. Uh, he gets red cheeks, mom said, but no rashes. Um, he had definitely has got abdominal symptoms with, with diarrhea. And he gets joint pain to the extent that mother described him as walking like an old man on, on the morning when he got an episode. A typical episode would last anywhere from two to four days, but he was getting an episode every three weeks. And he's completely well in between. And somebody had already put him on prophylactic azithromycin, which did not work. So this was a symptom diary. So this is another important thing I'd like to ex, uh, explain. When we are not sure about the periodicity and stuff, one of the things which we should ask parents to do is to keep a symptom diary because nothing gives you more information than a visual representation. So in this patient, you can see that she he had an episode for three days here. And after eight days, he gets another episode lasting two days. Then after another 10 days, he gets an episode lasting three days. Similarly, there's one lasting four days. Then two weeks later, he gets another one lasting three days, again, the temperature of 39.7. So basically, the story mom, mother was telling us was actually we could get a visual representation and we could easily understand why he was mis, uh, he was unwell for a lot of time. Apart from the cow's milk allergy, there was nothing at all in the family history. Initial blood tests were all normal um, during a clinic appointment because he, he, he looked completely well. Um, and then we advised that they should contact us when he has the next episode. So when he came in, he came in with a fever, high fever, abdominal pain and diarrhea and pain in the left elbow. So basically arthralgia, abdominal pain and high fever. His temperature was definitely 39, anywhere between 39 to 40. He was lethargic. There was no rashes. He had red lips, but again, nothing else to see. Mildly congested throat, um, no mouth ulcers. Abdomen was soft. His joints were normal. So there was no, although there was arthralgia, there was no arthritis. And the episode lasted about five days. His inflammatory markers were definitely elevated. His hemoglobin was low, which was probably because of inflammation. White cell count was high, neutrophil count was high, ESR was high, CRP was high. So this is a classical picture you would get in inflammation. Anemia, neutrophilia, thrombocytosis, and raised CRP and ferritin. And his serum amyloid A came back as 434, which even during an episode is quite high because the normal is less than 50 for us. All his extended inf infection screen came back as negative. My colleague had already done an autoimmunodeficiency, some of the tests for the immunodeficiency, and this came back as negative. And autoinflammatory genetics, which was at the time Sanger sequencing, came back as negative for FMF hits and traps. So we thought, why don't we start Colchicin and see what happens? Again, 
I probably skip this slide. And in December, we started colchicin at 500 milli micrograms. Milli um, sorry, it's briefly that's microgram. There was no response. We increased the dose, kept increasing the dose until we got to one milligram. And he actually had some response. He only had four brief episodes over a period of six months, which is the best he has been. But sadly, the episodes returned about six months later. And despite increasing to one milligram, he didn't tolerate it. So at this point, we thought we'll try him on prednisolone. So we'll try him as PFAPA. So give him a dose of prednisolone at the onset of symptoms and give another dose 12 hours later. Steroids definitely helped. Mom said, as soon as he gets this steroids, he is absolutely fine. But the problem was that the episodes were getting more frequent. So from two to three weeks, now he was having one every seven to days, which means that he was having steroids every seven to days, which was kind of affecting his behavior and he was becoming increasingly naughty and uh, aggressive and stuff like that. So there was, a, there was mom, mother was partly happy, but not fully happy. But it was during this point when we saw him, we found that he was having some articular rashes. So the GP was treating that as allergy. So we thought in a background of periodic fever, when you get articular rashes, we need to think about caps. So we revisit the genetic screen, send off his blood again for an NGS panel. Actually, they had the sample already for CAMPS. And then it showed up a rare mutation of NLRP3 gene. So Helen actually rang me with the result. And I said, Kishore, tell me the clinical picture. So I explained this is a clinical picture. And she said, I think it sounds like this is a perfect clinical picture for CAPS. This is a mutation which we are hitherto not found, but it's extremely rare in general population. This could possible that this is patho pathogenic. And we said, started Anakindra as a trial, and you know what, he had an excellent response. So the diagnosis eventually was CAPS with a response to Anakindra. My last case is a patient who I've been dealing with completely remotely. I've not seen this girl at all. It's all because of the COVID. Um, we could not transfer patients between hospitals. It's purely from emails and telephone conversation. We finally reached the diagnosis. So this is a three-month-old baby girl of Syrian origin who was born preterm 33 weeks with a birth weight of 2.56. Um, mother had type 2 diabetes, um, uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia, but the baby had received two doses of dexamethasone. There was mild respiratory distress at birth requiring CPAP for about 24 hours, and baby was started on IV antibiotics. But the problem was the baby had high CRP, and the antibiotics, when they started antibiotics after 48 hours, the CRP went up. So the, so the CRP was always abnormal for this patient, anywhere between 20 and 160. Because of the same reason, the neonatal team kept chasing for infection. So the patient had multiple blood cultures, um, urine cultures, uh, even a couple of lumbar punctures, but never grew anything. So she had multiple full septic screen and um, it never grew any organisms. So this patient was referred to me whether this could be a systemic autoinflammatory diseases, disease. The family history was very, very crucial in this patient. So it was a consanguineous relationship. So um, parents were first cousins. There are a lot of history of sibling loss. There were two healthy boys aged nine and two years, but they had lost three babies, all with different reasons. The first one was sounded like a vactal abnormality. The second baby had died of cirrhosis at three months of age. Again, we don't have any medical records. This is purely what the parents have told us. And they had another baby girl who passed away because of heart and brain abnormalities, um, but we don't have any records. Um, but the interesting bit of history was maternal grandfather has a diagnosis of FMF as Eson colchicin. And this patient's father, sister, a paternal aunt, has FMF and kidney failure, and she's awaiting kidney transplantation. So this is quite, quite damning, this family history. So with that picture, we had to consider an autoinflammatory disease. So basically, the clinical picture is persistently raised inflammatory markers. So persistent anemia, raised CRP, high white cell count, and platelets even up to 1,000. So almost um, uh, 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 10 lakhs. Uh, so that's how the platelets were, which is always a telltale evidence of chronic inflammation. The baby was failing to thrive. The birth weight was 2.56. And when we saw the baby in three months time, or when the baby was referred to me, the weight was only 2.58. So they clearly failure to thrive. And you could easily attribute that to chronic ongoing inflammation. But interestingly, there was no fever. There were no rashes. However, the baby clearly had splenomegaly. There are two centimeters splenomegaly. There is history of consanguinity and there is family history of FMF. So the question is, there's plenty in this patient to consider 
uh, systemic auto-inflammatory diseases. But I was very clear before I threw any medicine at her, we had to rule out infection. So they had an extensive infection screen, including TB, brucella, torch screen, et cetera, all of which came back as negative. The baby also had a sample sent off to a higher center to look for primary immunodeficiencies. I mean, the biggest worry was skin, um, severe combined immunodeficiency, and there was nothing at all, although the lymphocytes and everything were normal, um, uh, a basic immunodeficiency is negative. And I wondered about bone marrow, but then we had a chat with the hematologist, and the hematologist felt that this is you should this is a sign of chronic inflammation than anything infiltrative. So it could have been a congenital look, but they were very clear because of high nut white cell count and thrombocytosis is highly unlikely. This is probably a reactive bone marrow more than anything else. So the question what systemic auto-inflammatory disease should I consider? With the family history, FMF had to be considered, but there was no fever, let alone. But the good upside is it's quite easy to try something to treat. So what I did at this point in time is um, I spoke to Dr. Cesar Ozen, who is like an international expert on auto-inflammatory diseases. And she said, FMF can present like this because I had not heard about FMF presenting like this because they see this all the time. She's a Turkish consultant. And she emailed me saying that Kishore, it can FMF can present like this. So that's definitely something which we considered. CAPS was another thing. As you remember, I talked about NOMID. This NOMID is a condition which can present in early neonatal period. Um, but there was no musculoskeletal manifestation. There was no CNS manifestation. So that made CAPS highly unlikely. And there was no fever at all. Is it HITS? Again, possible because you can have HITS before first year of age. But I wasn't quite sure whether HITS can manifest at three months of age or probably from the neonatal age group. But splenomegaly was another thing which thought which this could be HITS. And other differential diagnosis, interferonopathies, which I think we'll come to later, but there was new neurological manifest. Basically, interferonopathies, you often get a CNS calcification, other things. There's nothing to suggest that. So with that clinical picture, we sent off the auto-inflammatory genetics. And I said, we should probably try colchicin. So colchicin was e very easy in this patient. In the sense, if it is FMF, the patient would respond. If it is HITS, it will not respond. HITS is one con condition, periodic fever, which will not respond to colchicin. Mm -hmm. The pay the baby failed the trial of cultures and the baby, con the CRP continued to be high and the weight gain continued to be poor. But the interesting thing is now the baby started having episodes of screaming. So the baby would scream nonstop for about one or two days and then have these episodes, which the pediatrician felt was because of abdominal pain, which is possible. Again, if it's a diagnosis of HITS, that is possible. So for a trial, we started, we started steroids during the episode and she had a good response. And not only that, the steroids had settled down the inflammatory markers and the growth better. And at that time, we had a genetics result coming back saying that this is consistent with myelinoid kinase deficiency or HIDS. And the patient is about to start anakindra, daily injections of anakindra. So that's the last case for me. I'll just have one slide on genetic testing. I must, the disclaimer is I am no expert in genetic testing, but I am grateful to Dhania who I had a quick word with before I did the talk to see what was available in India. So basically, when uh, about five years back, we were doing Sanger sequencing, which means it was just looking at one particular gene. So if you found the FMF genes, it, it looked for that, but it had lower sensitivity and lower discovery power. Whereas in NGS, you are looking at millions of fragments simultaneously, and that gives us much better yield or pickup. And that is quite cost effective if you have got a high number of charges, uh, targets. So what I'm told is, NGS is freely available in India in private sector. And I'm told there is no set systemic autoinflammatory diseases panel yet, as far as I know. And that's also probably uh, hampered by the fact that um, the mutations that are common in Indian population have not been kind of stratified or classified. However, even if you're refer referring a patient to geneticist, the interpretation of results needs very accurate clinical information. So this is where the clinician works with the dentist to come up with the right diagnosis, like I gave examples for. One word about anti-IL-1 treatment, which is sadly not available in India. The medicine Anakindra I was talking about is given as daily subcutaneous injection. And the other one we have in UK is Canakinumab, which is given as four weekly injections. So just to summarize, how do you approach a child with suspected periodic fever? There is absolutely no substitute for good history. It's very important to ask about family history, consanguinity, and in our situation where we see a multi-ethnic population, the ethnicity is important. Age of onset is very important. Periodicity. 
how long does each episode last how often does this happen so these are the most important questions which we need before in history before we embark on any examination and then you can have symptoms associated with any of these symptoms and because i've been doing this for a few years i have kind of got a tick box in my mind i go through symptoms the worst one i go for is abdominal pain and then you can have eye symptoms throat mouth ulcers lymphadenopathy rashes chest pain joint symptoms myalgia etc and that should it should be able to give you a clinical diagnosis at the end of it or at least a differential diagnosis investigations full blood count is important inflammatory markers are very important so please make sure ferritin is done as well serum amyloid a is helpful but i don't know whether it's available in india but as i said we need to rule out infection so all the necessary tests which are required to rule out infection is mandatory again we may have to think about immunodeficiencies um, that is other differential diagnosis that rules out however the most important thing is the timing of the testing is very important so if you see a patient between an episode it probably makes sense to see them during an episode so that you can do a clinical and a laboratory assessment while the patient is having the episode this is a couple of slides i have borrowed from my good friend uh, dr suma balan this was about the situation of auto inflammatory diseases in india and the challenges uh, it i think it's a more challenging clinical situation in setting which what more much more infections than what we see here um and again often the patient has been to too many hospitals there is um, a limited awareness of auto inflammatory diseases and uh, again some treatment modifications for example if the patient gets treated for if for something else with steroids that may help with the symptoms but with, that, that may not treat the condition and the families may have received other diagnosis before and then the financial challenges of getting the testing and as i said the indian mutations are still not reported so these are some of the challenges uh, in indian setting which hopefully we can overcome with collaborations like this in future years um the other, other other challenges faced is explaining the diagnosis and prognosis often there is need for long term treatment and many of these treatments are incredibly expensive and there should be a lack of financial support but most importantly there is lack of availability of il1 inhibitor so i work closely with one of the il1 anti il1 manufacturers and we have been kind of pushing um, lots of indian uk based and indian rheumatologists have been pushing them to actually provide anti il1 or make it available in india i if i would say is if there is if you're not sure you can ask a friend a rheumatologist a pediatrician with interest or you can even email me geeta madam both geeta madams have my got my contact number if you've got a difficult case you would me i am more than happy to help in whatever way i am as i said i am no expert but i i can share whatever i know about the symptoms uh, in the subjects to try and and i will be happy to take a few questions and once again thank you very much i have no words to thank uh thank you all um, for having me uh, do this i'm happy to take questions thank you very much geeta dr geeta is there uh, kishor uh, thank you for that wonderful session and we are having a couple of questions in the chat box rather than questions comments in the uh, chat box i will read it for you one minute Uh, first one is a comment from uh, Girish Subramanian. Trap is a TNF related. Doesn't uh, doesn't it seems more likely to be an autoimmune disease? That, that's a very interesting question. I think that is a debate uh, which kind of has gone gone on. But um, one of the reasons, I'm um, probably the wrong way to explain this. One of the reasons why we think. traps is more of an auto inflammatory than auto immune yeah, condition is that right. anti tnf doesn't really work for traps it works temporarily but if you look at the signs of systemic inflammation you often have um uh, systemic amyloidosis hyperferritinemia etc in these patients and uh, um anti tnf often if it works it works for short term sometimes it doesn't work at all it needs anti il1 uh to switch off the inflammation in these patients which is why putting different bits of the jigsaw together it is leaning more towards an auto inflammatory rather than auto immune and as i said in my second slide it is actually a spectrum because many of them are uh, not clear cut auto immune or auto inflammatory it's a spectrum in between but this is probably in the middle of the, probably to leaning towards auto inflammatory in that spectrum it is overlapping okay Okay, Kishore. Next question is from uh, Dr. Nadesh. 
prednisolone set to decrease duration between two episodes of FAPA. So if it is justified in it. Again, it's a it doesn't reduce the or doesn't increase the frequency in all patients. I must say that. We've had a few patients where it's increased and it's generally accepted that it may increase the frequency. For that reason, I think there is absolutely no harm in trying it because these patients uh, often lose three, four days um, a month of school. And uh, sometimes parents have to stay at home to take care of them, affecting their employment and other things. So I think it's, we need to see that in the larger picture. But if there is, if because of significant morbidity, I think there is absolutely no harm in trying prednisolone as, at first. And we are using uh, probably a dose a month, which is not going to have much cushing art effects anyway. So I think there's definitely something which is worth trying. However, if it comes to a stage where the frequency is increased to something like once a week or once in a couple of weeks, um, then we could probably stop it and try them on colchicine because we have got patients with PFAPA who have responded to colchicine or you could try a double pronged attack. So you could put them on colchicine for prophylaxis and give um, steroids, continue to give steroids for acute episodes. Uh, Hopefully that helps. Uh, Kishore, little more about Majid syndrome, Majid. So the, the reason I didn't uh, particularly discuss about Majid syndrome is um, that, that it is not a periodic fever syndrome. It's an auto-inflammatory <laughs> syndrome which predominantly affects uh, skin and bone. So this is so there is a condition which I just described where, where there is a, a skeletal um, involvement, auto-inflammatory syndrome with skeletal involvement, what what we call CRMO or chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. Now, these Majid syndrome is a much more severe variant of CRMO with younger age of onset with significant sin involvement and bone involvement, failure to thrive, etc., who need treatment much earlier. Uh, and many of them actually succumb if we don't treat them earlier. Um, that is why I think if you look at auto-inflammatory diseases, um, the whole list, it's an exhaustive list. I had to confine my discussion to periodic fever. Okay. However, I'm happy to do another session sometime later um, to go into the rest of the auto-inflammatory diseases, just to give you a flavor of what it is like. Thank, thank you, Dr. Kishore. Any, any triggering factors in recurrence of symptoms in periodic fevers? It really depends on what the periodic fever is. So one of the symptoms I would definitely ask in the history is um, whether parents have identified any triggers. Sometimes you can get actual infective triggers. Sometimes um, uh, I've got patient with a FM, um, and uh, I would say a non unclassified periodic fever syndrome with abdominal symptoms who has responded to colchicine, who has certain dietary triggers. Now, one could argue this could be abdominal migraine or whatever. I don't know what it is, but she has responded completely well to coaches. And so there can be triggers. And that is one benefit of keeping a symptom diary is that we can identify this trigger. So one thing I say is, can you please write down what do you think triggered this? Okay. Okay. Uh, whether the normal inflammatory markers, if the inflammatory markers are normal, whether it is reliably rule out an inflammatory syndrome, auto-inflammatory syndrome. The question is I, would, I, I think it's it almost always does. Yeah. Because yeah. I cannot think of a systemic auto-inflammatory disease with normal inflammatory markers. So you can have one or two of the cap, uh, parameters normal, but with a completely normal CRP, ESR, ferritin, I, 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 one of the telltale evidence of inflammation is raised inflammatory markers. So I, it would be very difficult to substantiate a, a diagnosis of auto-inflammatory disease in the absence of raised inflammatory markers. The uh, other question is, I, I think Dr. M. G. Gida will answer that question during her concluding remarks. Which lab provide free genetic analysis in India? Ne next is, uh, how common in periodic fever in India? Kishore, I, I really don't know. Uh, that, how uh, common I, I, is periodic I, fever in India? It should be there. It should be fairly common with the genetic pool we have. Uh, I yeah. think it is probably underdiagnosed and underrecognized. And I think the fact that we have got so many infections that we confuse the situation with doesn't make it any easier. But I don't have any literature evidence to suggest what the potential incidence could be. But I think if this talk helps you to think 
whether this could be a periodic fever when you see somebody with this symptom complex i think i won the battle okay sir sure. even though time is 9:30 i will i i will read three or four questions more one is can primary immunodeficiency coexist with auto inflammatory syndrome yes that is um uh it can coexist Which with auto inflammatory diseases and it can coexist with auto immune conditions so we have for uh, for example we have a boy with common variable immunodeficiency coexisting with juvenile idiopathic arthritis no it may be an arthritis part of cvia but the thing is cvid but in children if you have got inflammatory arthritis lasting for more than 6 weeks before your 16th birthday it's called jie and treated accordingly so this is a patient who is a, who is who has got a primary immunodeficiency who is actually on etanercept to treat his arthritis so they can coexist uh another question is is there any cardiac manifestation found in auto inflammatory syndrome question is usually not Pfizer. described in primary conditions but i think there are case reports of um um but there are two parts to it there is clearly an increased evidence of cardiovascular morbidity with increasing age in patients with fmf there are lots of reports from turkey say that which whether that is a baggage they carry because of chronic long standing inflammation i wouldn't know the other thing is again if you have got um, a macrophage activation syndrome complicating one of this you can get a myocardial myocarditis picture and you can like just like pimps ts to be honest and you can have a a a, a deranged cardiac function but prima facie cardiac involvement as a um, established picture of any other periodic fevers is less likely and um, the last question is kishor if genetic mutation is negative for fmf and response to colchicin with uh, with the phenotype of lmf do we label as unclassified periodic fever so yeah i think it, it it doesn't really matter what you call it as because i have had patients who have had a clinical picture of fmf whose mutation is negative who have responded brilliantly to colchicin and i've just called them colchicin respond responsive unclassified periodic fever syndrome as long as your patient is better they do not get renal amyloidosis they are thriving well they are growing developing well what's in a name i would just keep colchicin going the only thing is if you don't have a genetic diagnosis you give it for a few years and then you can probably try them off the medicine to see what happens if the symptoms recur you need to put them back okay thank you thank you dr kishor for that excellent presentation and there are many congratulations and appreciation in the chat box kindly for you kindly, kindly yeah. go through it I, i am not in a position to read all and That's it is uh, i definitely know many senior faculty members and including many of respected teachers uh, are there in the platform and because of the time constraints i am not in a position to unmute them also with this i invite dr mg geeta our key organizer of the program for concluding remarks dr geeta please tell about the genetic test availability in the in india also sorry geeta madam before you say can i just mention one thing yeah. i cannot yeah. thank you enough for the very kind words and comments my esteemed teachers um um colleagues and um uh, have have posted in the group um i i'm just ever so grateful thank you very much and it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be doing this lecture in this esteemed um uh, group uh, presence of in the presence of these uh, esteemed personalities thank you very much uh it was really fantastic kishore uh, listening to you and uh, this is exactly what we were hoping for that we have a very colorful and interesting lid opener so that all of us are now really have our antenna antenna up and want to learn more about the specific uh, other auto inflammatory uh, syndromes it's uh, it's uh, we, we can't thank you enough too and uh, next week we have professor helen lackman from the ucl division of medicine uh, you already mentioned you work closely with her she would be talking about understanding traps and hits so it's going forward from here and we all cordially invite you to be with us next friday at 9 pm and in your talk you have alluded to the importance of a thorough meticulous history 
and also how important it is to work in tandem with the molecular geneticists to work hand in hand. So we are actually experiencing this and it's, uh, it's been a wonderful journey. We're looking forward to more. And there's a question about genetic testing in India. I think we have Dr. Vinod's career who would be the best person to answer that. Dr. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, Gita, over to you, Dr. Vinod. Dr. Vinod, please unmute. Vinod, unmute yourself. Uh, you are still mute, Vinod. Please unmute. Ah, okay. I can hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are audible. Okay, sorry, I missed you. Missed the question. Yeah, there was a question about genetic testing in India. How it is available, uh, free of cost? What are the ways in which clinicians can access it? So I thought you would be the best person to answer. That. <laughs> okay, so the genetic test is available in multiple different formats across the country. Okay, for uh, when you when you talk about exome sequencing or panels, typically there are a couple of good, uh, at least two to three private laboratories which are offering it as a service, fee for service, uh, which are quite good. Uh, apart from that, there is the program that we run, which is called Guardian, which is a research program. It's not a clinical service uh, where we do whole exome sequencing as well as whole genome sequencing in cases which turn out to be negative for whole exome sequencing. But of course, the limitation is that we have inclusion criteria. It has to be a familial case. It has to be, uh, I mean, uh, clinically worked up, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the outcomes are, so we want to work with uh, institutes like, for example, Calicut Medical College, we have worked for five years to set up the, the infrastructure to make a diagnosis and also to build a very focused test, uh, which can be implemented back in the clinics. Like for example, for HITS, we have a hotspot mutation test on Sankar, which is now implemented in Calicut. So we, we would always want to work with a center, which can, uh, uh, which can actually take it the, to the end point. And apart from that, there are single gene test, uh, not many, but for very specific test, very few centers run their single gene test. So that is pretty much the landscape of the genetic test available. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Hope that answers the question. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, continue, Gita. Yeah. So uh, we are really grateful to all our teachers, senior members of the profession, colleagues and students for being with us and listening uh, to this very interesting talk from Dr. Kishore. So thank you so much to all the delegates. Thanks to uh, Dr. Vinod, uh, Dr. Ajit, Ashraf, and everybody uh, from IAP Calicut, Dr. Nikhas, and our hosts, Dr. Renjit and Dr. Ajay, who have done a fantastic job. There was, it was absolutely crystal clear the sound and the picture that we couldn't hope for anything better. So uh, we all, we, we thank our senior members of the profession so much, uh, Professor Parvati, Professor CK Shashidharan, and all the senior uh, faculty members and our teachers who have sort of graced this occasion and uh, made us want to do more of such programs. So uh, thank you all. And see you next Friday at 8 p.m. Uh, to listen to Professor Helen Lackman on yeah. chat and hints. Thank you.